Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing? Just remind you, on the table outside, you can sign up for the Sabbath practice, four weeks, starting on next week, 9.15 downstairs. So I encourage you to do that. And there are four series in this. It's uh, Sabbath, prayer, solitude, and I don't remember the fourth one, but there we are. Sleep, no. Rest, okay. And then there's also Rooted. If you haven't taken Rooted, you can also sign up for that. I encourage everybody who has not taken Rooted to start out with this. And that is 10 weeks, and Ty is going to be uh, doing that. Well, as Gabby said, we were down in Phoenix for a few days, but before that we were in uh, Palm Springs. Um, I'm on the board of a, a church in Canada, a large church, and they know the guy who owns the Frank Sinatra compound. Uh, and it is original. Everything is absolutely original in that compound. And so we were there. And of course, you'd think it'd be fancy. It's not really that fancy because it's the 1960s kind of a theme. I mean, and old Frank, apparently, he was a small guy, five foot seven. But he, he, so his bed's five foot eight or five foot nine. It's not a normal length bed. And the, he liked orange. So his whole bedroom was orange. Everything in his bedroom. The other thing about him is quite interesting. He didn't believe in just one bathroom for husband and wife or male and female. So the bungalows around this compound, they had two bathrooms. One for male, one for female. And I thought that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> Guys, who would agree with me? <laughs> um, then uh, the interesting thing is there was somebody there who's also on the board of advisors, which I, I also serve on, from Sweden. His name's Carl Gustav Severin. And he has been working in many nations, there are over 600 churches just in Russia right now. And we asked him what he thought, the, he thought the pastors were saying about the war, and he says they cannot stand the war, and they're praying for the end of the war. And the pastors from Russia, his conglomerate, uh, are in contact with the pastors from Ukraine where he also has a number of churches. His church in, um, in Moscow has 6,000 people who attend every single week. Isn't that amazing? And in Sweden, he's doing an amazing work. Uh, he ministered to a rapper, a well-known rapper in Sweden, who gave his heart to the Lord. And his name's Sebastian. And Sebastian is getting his, and he was also not only a rapper, but he was a gang member. And he's getting these gang members saved in Sweden. And they are now doing tent meetings in Sweden. In February, they're going to have three tent meetings where they expect between four and 6,000 people at each of these tent meetings. Can you imagine socialist Sweden having a revival like that? And so I pray, even so, Lord, come quickly right here in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, that's the, the plug for the week. Next week, uh, we're going to look at the 70 weeks of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. So if you'd like to brush up on that or read about that for next week, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Everybody asks about that, talks about that. And then the following week, I'm going to finish up Daniel, and I'm going to be talking about the resurrection and the eternal glory of God's people. And so let me start with a few comments. You and I are, unpredict are incurable predictors. We always want to predict something, always want to know something. We predict the, the weather based on everything from extremely sophisticated radar to the groundhog. 
Every year, sports writers predict who will win the World Series. Well, we know now uh, the Mariners are out, but that's another thing if you're interested in baseball. Uh, we, the various channels that predict what will happen in the stock market. And so there is many things that we try to predict that we try and think of. And, and included in that is all the situation or the situation that goes on or will go on at the end of the age. And so as we look at this um, particular teaching, I kind of brushed over it last time, but this time I'm going to get really into the weeds. And so take your Bibles if you have them, and you can, watch on, you can look on your notes for Daniel chapter 7. We come to one of the most uh, incredible chapters in the Bible, and it is a clear view of human history and the deity of Jesus Christ. And there's a jarring uh, picture of the persecution of the saints. Recently, I was reading Voice of Martyrs, and I read a, an article about a young Christian Indonesian girl who, uh, and Indonesia, as you might know, is the largest Muslim population in the world. Her faith underwent the most severe test imaginable. The government requires that every single person, all their citizens, carry ID cards which indicate, amongst other things, their religious preference. Approximately 10% of people in Indonesia claim to be Christians. But there has also been and continues to be a, a rising account of persecution at the hands of Islamic fundamentalist groups. And one faithful day, fateful day, this young girl was at a Bible camp. They had an evening worship service and the local official came in and said they were singing too loud and they needed to tone it down a bit. And so they sang quieter, but within the hour, a stone crashed through the window and beginning a night of attack by these extremists. A large rock hit this young girl on her head and knocked her to the ground. It wasn't long before the attackers were in the church building itself. And what do kids do? Well, what they did was they began to pray. One of the Muslims who had just burst in grabbed her by the arm and lifted her to her feet and said, are you a Christian? And she said, we are all Christians. The man picked up a large shard of glass from the broken window and pressed it to her stomach and said, repeat this after me. He tried to force her to deny her faith. She cried out silently in prayer that she would not deny her faith, but would remain strong. And when she did not answer this man, he became even more enraged. And so he pressed even harder with the shard, starting to punch her the skin and said, do you believe that your God can help you now? She said, yes, I belong to God and I believe he will save me. He then grabbed a stick and started beating her across her shoulders, shouting at her, you think I'm not strong? I am stronger than you. She kept on praying to God for strength. When the man realized he was not going to get her to deny her faith, he stopped and he looked at her and he said, you are stronger than I am. And he dropped the stick and left. With tears coming down her cheeks, she said later, Jesus was willing to die for me and shed his blood on the cross. He did this all for all of us. So it doesn't matter what happens to me. I am willing to suffer for him. And you know, that story is not unlike what we've been uh, exploring in Daniel with Daniel and his friends. We like stories of deliverance. But you know, in Daniel chapter 7, it seems that the saints are given over into the hands of a world ruler who will make war on them and be successful for a time. So how do we, as normal people, understand that God, who is so powerful, who can do anything that, we, uh, that he desires, how is it that for a period of time he leaves his saints to suffer at the hands of evil oppressors? I don't know if you've ever questioned that. Well... You know, it's all written in Scripture for a time such as this. So you and I need not be fearful about the future. In Daniel 7 verse 1, it says, In the first year of Balthazar's 
king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions passed through his mind. He was lying on his bed and he wrote down the substance of his dream. Now, here's an encouragement to each one of you. If you have vivid dreams, if you have dreams that seem to involve the supernatural, I'm not talking about the, the, the guy with the, the horns and the fork. I'm talking about God. If you have supernatural dreams, write them down. If you see visions, write them down because God might not only be speaking to you through that dream or that vision, but he might be speaking to you to convey that to the body of Christ. You see, God's only got you and I down here on earth. He could send angels, but he doesn't. He uses us to convey his messages to the world. And this was in the first year of his reign. And he was the one who had that banquet, that feast, which was interrupted by the writing on the wall. And it was that night, that night of revelry, that the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar died nine years previously in about 532 B.C., so it gives you some structure of where we're at. And then there were a series of rulers, but none of them could hold on to the power of the Babylonian Empire. And so there were assassinations and coups. It was a time of instability and political upheaval. And one night, Daniel has a dream and a vision, and he writes them down. And it is... It has the idea of predictive prophecy, something that's going to happen in the future. It can't be explained in human logic. Verse 1 says he wrote it down so that we have enough to see the sovereignty of God and enough to believe. Now, we're right at the juncture or the midpoint of the book of Daniel. The book divides in half. Chapters 1 to 6 uh, are the historical accounts of Daniel in the court of the Gentiles. In chapter 7 to 12, well, we, have, we know the, ap uh, the apocalyptic uh, section. Apocalyptic means unveiling or revealing the pulling away of the future. And this is where the book of Revelation is similar in aspects to the book of Daniel. And that's why Next week, we'll deal with the 70th week, and then we'll deal with the second coming of Christ in that last week, where we look at Daniel and Revelation together. A summary of chapter 7 is contained in verses 17 and 18, and if you have the time, go and read that. I think it's a perfect summary. There are four great beasts, four great kingdoms that will arise from the earth but the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever and ever and ever. Now, as always remember, this is what you need to remember. When you are studying scripture, always look at the context where those scriptures are found. The verses around what you are reading, as well as other scriptures that might be elsewhere in the Bible. It must be consulted. All too often, people preach their opinions. And that's why we have so much erroneous teaching and, frankly, wrong-headed Christians out there because they've taken some stuff on board that is what I call extra-biblical. They've extracted one little piece out of Scripture and they, they've made a doctrine of it, and that is incorrect. And so <clears throat> the, there are four beasts which come out of the sea. Verse 1 to 8, and I'm going to be reading quite an extensive amount of scripture for you. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion and had wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were, were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood two, on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your full of flesh. Um, after that, I looked, and before me, there was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back, it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. 
After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was the fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was so different from all the form, former beasts and had ten horns. And while I was thinking about the horns, Daniel writes, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were rooted, uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So Daniel sees the vision of a sea. Now he sees the churning winds uh, up out of the sea, and then the four beasts. Now, firstly, let me give you some explanation. Sea is symbolic of the turbulence in the nations of the world. So this was a time of turbulence in the nations that he sees. And so pick up any newspaper, watch the news bulletins, and you see the raging of many nations. And what are the beasts? Verse 15 and 16. We see Daniel's confused and troubled in spirit. So he asks the angel for information. Why are the kingdoms called beasts? Why the vision of the beasts for human kingdoms? Well, I think it is these are huge empires that conquer, usually represent humanity at its worst. Bestial and dominant, savage fury with total dominance over lesser adversaries. Now, can you imagine dreaming this in a night? And so we have the contrast between God's kingdom and human kingdoms. Human kingdoms are advanced by conquest like a beast they consume their lesser adversaries. Christ's kingdom, on the other hand, advances by self-sacrifice, like a lamb slaughtered. They advance by ripping and tearing flesh, but our kingdom advances by self-sacrifice as we take up our crosses to follow Jesus and lay down our lives. Now, Let's look who these beasts were. Firstly, the first beast can be none other than Babylon. It's a description of a lion with eagle's wings. A lion, uh, as we know, is the king of the jungle. Nebuchadnezzar apparently had a preoccupation with lions, and excavations of Babylon have shown that there are lions decorating all their walls. The Ishtar Gate of Babylon, for example, had blue ceramic tile with golden lions. And, uh, and an interesting lion that had wings was at the main entrance of the royal area of the city. So I don't know if that particular image influenced what Daniel was seeing, but it, he, we believe it is Babylon. These, the wings that they had represent mobility and sovereign power. And just as a lion, the king of the beasts, so eagles are the king of the birds. But then judgment from God comes on this beast. The wings are torn off, the beast is lifted from the earth. And so there is a human aspect to this and given to this beast, and that's a human heart. And so I reference that because of what happened in Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. You remember Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4? He was given the mind, his mind was turned over into that of a beast until he repented and acknowledged that God is sovereign over all. Do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar, what Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar? King, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sin by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. Could it be? And we don't have an account of this. But could it be that after his repentance that he was a different man? We don't have any archaeological discoveries about that, but maybe we'll find old Nebuchadnezzar in heaven one day with us and then you can ask him. The second beast is the Medo-Persian Empire, verse 5. And it, most of the great leaders of the Medo-Persian Empire were Persians like Cyrus the Great. Again, we can read of Cyrus the Great in Scripture. And this beast is eating three ribs. Commentators are divided about that, but it could refer to areas that were conquered by this particular force, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. But the empire's self-serving brutality is evident here. And it's also a command given, get up 
and eat your full of flesh. In other words, this is a particularly violent group of people that rip and tear and are never satisfied. The third beast is Greece, verse 6, and it is a description of a leopard with four wings. The leopard is sleek, agile, deadly, with lightning quick movement, movement with four wings, giving a sense of lightning quick conquest. And if you read uh, history, under Alexander the Great, that's exactly what happened. They used to just storm into these countries and overtake them in a very short period of time. And so Greece, also with four heads, could be referred to the fact that Alexander's empire, the, at his death, he, only, he died in the, in, when he was in his 30s, was split into four between different generals and etc. The fourth beast, now this is an interesting one, Rome, verses 7 and 8. The fourth beast is not described. It is so terrifying that when Daniel saw this vision that he could not even describe it. And that's why Daniel says, I couldn't get it down on paper. It was a terrifying beast. Two words underscore how terrifying it was and how much fear Daniel felt. It had iron teeth and bronze claws. And so now we're at the heart of eschatology, end time teaching. And it's really hard to understand all of this symbolism, isn't it? I can tell you I spent hours and hours and hours going through all this stuff so I don't uh, feed you junk, but that you actually get what I believe the Lord is saying to us. And then there are ten horns. What are they? If you look at the image in Revelation chapter 17, of the Antichrist, which overthrows three rulers and the other rulers give them their power to him so that he can rule over the whole world. Now, this is a complex vision, and some have tried to put it together because we have also the vision of the second coming of Christ, who returned to set up his kingdom during the time of the fourth beast. I don't fully understand it, but there is a continuity to it. Verse 9. There's a heavenly throne. Now you can imagine in the midst of all that Daniel's seen in his vision and his dream, now he sees the heavenly throne. As I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. White is purity. And uh, on his head, the hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. Now, that fire that we see in around the throne could be the Holy Spirit. We don't know because we see in other parts of Scripture where the Holy Spirit is, is demonstrated with fire. And then uh, a river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him, thousands upon thousands attending. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. You see, there is going to be a day when you and I will give an account of our lives. But thank God for Jesus, because all our past is under the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Thank you for that, brother. <laughs> and then I... I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into a blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven." And we can read in Revelation again, he comes on a white horse to execute judgment. And he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every tongue and language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Thank God for Jesus. And I thank God that you and I have made a decision to serve him. So what is the purpose of this section in the midst of all this 
violence and stuff. The point is that we've got this little horn speaking blasphemy, making war against the saints, and the heavenly court is then seated. In God's court, this will not be tolerated forever. He will not allow the war on the saints forever. He's going to intervene in the events of earth. And so he renders a decision, and the final form of that evil empire is destroyed, and Christ returns to set up his kingdom. So let's move on. Verse 15 to 28. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the vision that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of this. One of those who was standing there was an angel. So he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever and ever. So there's the contrast. The evil kingdoms rise from the earth. There's men of evil who will oversee them. And on the other hand, there is you and I, the saints of the Most High God. Daniel doesn't get it, so he asks for wisdom. Remember James chapter 1 and verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Gabby had a word for some people here this morning about those who need to make a decision. Ask God to help you in that situation. And then we have the terror of the fourth beast, verse 19. I want you to know the true meaning of the, the fourth beast, which is different from all the others and most terrifying. With its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victim and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before it, which the three of them fell down before. The horn that looked more imposing than the others that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints. Verse 23. So, there will be other kingdoms, and I'm not going to read verse 23, but you can see what will happen. He wanted us to know about this fourth beast. And the fourth beast is Rome. Not merely content to conquer, Rome had to crush its, his, its adversaries. In the second Punic, Punic War, P-U-N-I-C, when they defeated Carthage, they were not satisfied with just destroying the city. But they systematically went through all the fields around the city and sowed them with salt so that nothing would ever grow there again, and it never has. Can you believe how destructive? And then we have these ten horns, which are a symbol of strength and power. And a horn usually represents a king. Ten horns or ten kings from the fourth beast. The angel actually gives us very little information about it. Some people have speculated that these are NATO countries or the European common market. I don't go there because I don't know explicitly, and so I'll just leave that alone. And so the rise of the little horn, verse 20 and 21 and 24 and 25, the horn's description is that it is little, but later it says that it was more imposing than all the other. How could it be little and yet be imposing? I believe it speaks of that little horn growing in strength, growing in might. Maybe it's a small uh, nation. Maybe it is a king that is not very powerful when he starts out, but as he grows in stature and power, that's how uh, he gets more powerful. It has the eyes of man. In other words, there's an earthly wisdom about this, and it speaks boast boastfully. This is a great theme, a great big theme with Antichrist, speaking boastfully against God, especially a God. Uh, he will speak against the Most High. Now, he has an interesting thing. This horn will arise out of nowhere. And it uproots and subdues three kings, but most specifically, it wars again on the saints. Verse 21 and 25. As I watched, 
this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. And defeating them. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. Now, that's what we're going to get into next week. We're going to look at Daniel's 70th week. Now, this is not the triumph of the lion's den, but this is the suffering of the saints. So there will come a time when the saints at that point in time who are living on the earth will suffer persecution and will suffer. And the scripture is clear. First, we will have persecution and then even martyrdom. And then we will have the glory of a worldwide kingdom. Antichrist is permitted by God for a short period of time to persecute the saints. And so for three and a half years, what is called the Great Tribulation, the saints are crushed and destroyed during this period. And it says that he changes the set times and seasons. So where does the term antichrist come from? Now, I pray that none of you are fearful today after what you've been hearing. Because our God is a just God. Our God is a good God. Our God, you might have to, we might have to go through stuff. But our God has promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. I believe the scripture teaches that there are antichrists present now, and they, but there will be a great antichrist in the future. 1 John 2 verse 18, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you've heard, that the antichrist is coming, and the, that, that's the future antichrist. Even now, many antichrists have come. So there are antichrists who deny Christ right now, living in this earth but not the great Antichrist, if I may call it that. 1 John 2, 22, who is the liar? The man, it is the man who denies that Jesus, Christ, Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist. He denies the Father and the Son. John gives us an, an effective theological definition of Antichrist. So, Antichrist, according to the scriptures, is anyone who denies in a powerful way that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And furthermore, they deny the incarnation and the deity of Christ. Satan has three great attacks on the church even today. Number one, persecution. Number two, worldliness or corruption by the world. And number three, false teaching. And we can already see that in the church today, can't we? We can see that there is persecution. We can see that many have adopted the worldliness of the, the things of the world in the church. There's also corruption in the church. We read that and it breaks my heart every time I do. And then there's also false teaching. As I said, it's going on right now. In 2 Thessalonians 3, do not any, let anyone deceive you in any way. For the final day has not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man of lawlessness, who's that? That's Antichrist, is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. And so he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself as God. And 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8 and 9 says this. The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed. Listen to this. There will be all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders. So the future Antichrist will come with great power that no one will be able to explain. He will sit in God's temple. He'll proclaim himself to be God. And for three and a half years, he will attack the saints. And the saints will be given over to his hand until Jesus comes and overthrows him. What a glorious day 
that is going to be. Amen? So what does that have to do with you and me right now? Okay, Peter, we understand all of that. Those are the four beasts. It seems like they're all gone. What's going to happen? What does it mean to you and I? Well, it means everything and it means nothing. First, could it be that what God is doing in the world is bigger than any of the problems you might be experiencing now? Could it be that God is going to do, is doing in the world, is bigger than ourselves, working a plan that is so majestic and glorious that we only see a very small part of it? And so Daniel 7 lays out this magnificent tapestry of all of human history and the second coming of Christ. And let me say this, there's no connection to your troubles, but there is a connection of how you fit into world history if you're part of the kingdom of Christ. And that to me is the most exciting part of all this. Yes, if I let my mind dwell on everything that's going to happen with Antichrist and all that, I could get fearful. But I know that for you and I, God has chosen us for a time such as this. You're not alive by accident at this point in time in history. God has a plan and a purpose for you for a time such as this. And I close with this quickly. What we are called to do, we are called to be living testimonies of God's glory and God's mercy. We are called to serve him in this day and age. And as I said last week, it's more than just coming to church on a Sunday. God has wonderful plans for each one of you. Yes, we face momentarily, we face issues with our health. Car breaks down. We have problems in our family. Whatever it is, problems on the job. We don't have enough money for this or that or the next thing. But those are momentary issues because one day, one day, he's coming in the clouds and we will see him and we'll spend eternity with him. Now that's something to rejoice about. Amen. God bless you. Hope you enjoyed that. If you had the bejeebus scared out of you after this morning, <laughs> speak to me because God has a plan for your life. I want you to know that. What do you need? Uh, just make an announcement. Huh? Thank you. And, and the rest of the week, I, for, for example, last week, for the boys, they do useful skill set in the household. Like using WD-40 to fix squeaky dough. I don't know any one of you, many of you actually know how to fix it, and they learn that. So the so girls have the sweet talk, means they go out to a shop, have a you know, sweet. So 
they are pretty active and very good. The age is not different. I mean, it's not problem. They have different people taking care of different group of kids. So I encourage you. I know it's Friday night, and but I encourage you to bring the youth, the youngster, to every Friday if you can make it. If you cannot, once a month, special topic really worth to come. Like coming Friday will be uh, uh, science and faith. They talk very frankly. They do most most of their talk are very interactive. Very few persons. They they lead you to specific area, but it's very interactive. And I will be there every week. If I I cannot be there, Alejandro will be there. So someone will taking care of the youngster from our church too. So. I hope I can see you guys every Friday. Thank you. When? What time is it? 6.30 uh, is a dinner time. It's, they start at 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. And the activity is quite packed. They, they are not getting bored at all. OK. So you guys could go out for a date, drop the kids, and say bye. <laughs> all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to uh, speak the benediction, and then we can have one worship song. So you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you there. Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose in you being there. Christ who indulges you has something He wants to do through you wherever you are. The Holy Spirit who guides and leads you will show you things to come. Be open to his leading. Believe this and go in his love and grace and power. In the name of him who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.